So my name is Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo Figueroa. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Michigan. And I work with paleontology of fishes, specifically fishes that lived before the time of the dinosaurs in the Paleozoic era. Yeah, so it, uh, it's exciting on several different grounds. So first of all, most, um, the group that it pertains to, we, we call wraith and fishes or acnopterygians, it represents the most diverse group of backbone animals that we have in extant times, meaning that among living species of vertebrates, they are the most diverse group. Um, so you have more than 35,000 species of this group right now, which includes basically anything that you think when you, you're considering a fish, from a tuna, sardines, the, the clownfish from Finding Nemo, they're all raven fishes. Um, and, but if you go back in time to the early evolution of the group, they were pretty much um, not super diverse. They, you had like a few groups of fishes that pretty much look all the same superficially, but they tell us a lot, they, they tell us a lot about the evolution of the group from the start. Um, so that's why it's important to study the brain, especially soft tissue preservation in a brain that's that old. So it will inform us about the initial stage of the evolution of the group. Um, the other important point is that raven fishes are the sister lineage of lobe fishes, which includes us humans. Sister lineage means that they, we share a common ancestry with them that directly divided into one side lobe fishes and the other side raven fishes. So if we understand a little bit better the evolution of the brain of the raven fishes and how does this brain relates and is similar or not to our own brain, we can understand better the evolution of vertebrates as a whole and also the evolution of our brain. Paleontology might seem like a very like static uh, field when you approach by the media because you normally imagine paleontologists going to the field and digging fossils with hammer, sickle, and like uh, other like field classic equipment. But paleontology is very dynamic and we adapt and we adopt new techniques and new methods to study more and understand much better the evolution of the groups and the evolution of life on Earth. Um, so several approaches, including CT scanning, are considerably changing how we can access the information in the fossil record. So we're basically using this sort of methods such as CT scanning to access information that previously was difficult or impossible to acquire. Um, in the case of CT scanning, it is super useful because we can access information that's inside these fossils without manually preparating them or destroying or removing parts to see the inside. So it works basically the same as when you go to the doctor and do a CT scan or, or a radiograph. You're looking inside your body without having to open it or do like any sort of surgery. So basically the same thing that we do with fossils. We look inside them using CT scanning without destruction. And since we're not destroying or um, modifying it in any way, we, see, we can sometimes see structures or other features of the fossil that would other be lost during this process of uh, preparation. Um, and that's exactly why we found this fossilized brain there because we could access it, look at it inside without opening it. get the opportunity to go to the field quite often. Um, so most of my field work is in South America, more specifically in Brazil, where I'm from. Uh, so since I'm here in the US, there's of course a little bit of logistics to get down there to Brazil. But since when I'm there, um, it mostly pertains to like going to outcrops, which are basically a fancy name that we use for localities. So like areas where the rock that includes the fossils are exposed to the surface. And so we can collect them more easily. Um, so I go to the field. I find these localities that expose the rocks of the correct age of the correct environment. And then I, with my research groups and collaborators that I have down there, we extract big blocks of rock from that area and then systematically separate small pieces and small pieces of it, trying to find fossils and then putting them into the collections uh, in the museums in Brazil. When I'm in the field, I normally stay down in Brazil for about two, three weeks, maybe a little bit more, and go around localities in a big region. Brazil is a quite big country, very similar in size to the US. So I cannot, cannot collect in the whole country in one single field trip. 
So I go to several different regions depending on the year and depending on the time of the year and stay there for a few days collecting fossils. And it's just basically the best part of my job. <laughs> Yeah, so it goes well far back when I was around four or five years old. Um, I was already interested in, in fossils and, and past life because my parents also had an interest in science and they showed me uh, fossils in museums and expositions. And I had, of course, I had like toy dinosaurs and stuff. Um, but I really got into paleontology after watching Jurassic Park for the first time and realizing how cool all that was and that like life on Earth was so different in the past. Um, so yeah, since I was that age, I started getting interested in the field and started looking more not only into dinosaurs, but as other groups of animals and plants in the fossil record um, and then studying a little bit more. So when I got into undergrad, like in college, I decided, I figured out that I could mix my two interests, which were one side fishes, because I always loved sea life and like going to the beaches and like um, fishing and, and diving, and then mix that with what I also really like, which is paleontology. So I ended up studying uh, paleontology of fishes. Uh, and that was way back still in like 2013 when I started college. And I just decided to keep going in that direction until now in the PhD program. <laughs>